Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is the fifth book of the Bible. And last week we have looked at this chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 8. So you would need your Bible, so keep that open. And if you have your bulletin, it will come in handy uh, towards the end of the sermon as well. But we have looked at last week how the Israelites have spent 40 years in the wilderness. And now they're literally at the reach, within reach of the promised land. So they have finished the journey, the long and rigorous journey of 40 years in the wilderness. And they're now about to enter the promised land. And God has graciously explained to them the reason why he has intentionally led them through the 40 years in the wilderness. And this is the, the whole book that is dedicated to God recapping all the things that they have went through. And also at the same time, he is allowing them to look forward to all the things that are to come in the promised land. And God is teaching them, you know what, I have led you through the 40 years and I have also given you the law. And God is reminding them, teaching them again the law that God has given them. And looking forward and teaching them that God is very, very much interested in the very bottom of their hearts. Right? So that was the last uh, week's message where God is telling them, you know, as you're about to enter the promised land, keep in mind that I'm interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is your heart. I'm interested in knowing what is in your heart. And that is the reason why I have led you through the 40 years in the wilderness. To know what is occupying your heart. And he is also uh, is teaching them that I have provided with you. Provided you all the things that you needed in your wilderness. In your 40 year journey through the desert. I have given you the heavenly bread. I have given you the water. So look for it always. Keep in mind to the heavenly bread instead of always living for the earthly bread. And then we have concluded that because of all that, because God had a purpose, a divine purpose in leading them through the 40 years, and also because God has also provided them with the heavenly and divine provisions for all the things that they have needed, their time in the wilderness is worthwhile. And they can give God praise, magnifying the Lord even in the wilderness because of what God has done and what God is continuing to do in the, in the wilderness. So think with me here. So we have learned that the Israelites have grumbled all through 40 years. Even despite of seeing all the miraculous signs of God, they have lived in discomfort, anger, uh, and they have rebelled against the Lord constantly through 40 years, longing to go back to their lives of Israel. So it was a terrible way to follow the Lord in the wilderness, right? Can you, can you imagine? It was a horrible way to follow God. But my question for you this morning is this. Could they do any worse than that? All 40 years, can you imagine you being a mom or you being a dad, trying to bring your child to a nice place? And all the way through, they're grumbling. They're, they're saying how they're mad and how they're discontent, how they're uncomfortable, and how they're rebellious against you. So the whole ride was a terrible ride. And do you think it could get any worse? Oh yes, it could get worse because they uh, did not stop there. Their problem in the wilderness was not solved the moment they have entered the promised land. Think with me here. All through 40 years, they had been treading through the wilderness with one thing in mind, the promised land. They were longing for this promised land. Good food, rich lands, being, living a good, comfortable life in the promised land. This is the only thing they had been looking forward to all those 40 years. But once they got into the promised land, once they have received all of that, the one thing they've been longing for, waiting for, for all those years, once they have received all of that, the Bible tells us that they were very quick to forget the Lord and forsake the Lord. So I think it's even worse than being rebellious in the wilderness, don't you think? Coming into the promised land, enjoying all the good things that God has provided for them, 
enjoying all the benefits, and yet forgetting and forsaking God. I think that life is worse than their discontent life in the wilderness. Because at least in the wilderness, they were seeking the Lord. They were with God, living in, in that camp 40 years through their journey. They were walking, with, walking in the presence of the Lord in the wilderness, but in pride, they couldn't see the divine purpose and the divine provisions of the Lord, and they have sinned against God by, re by responding in anger, discontent, and rebellion. But do you think all that would have gone away once they had reached the promised land? Like I said, no. The problem continued, and by that we know the problem was not the wilderness. The reason they lived in sin, in rebellion, the reason they lived in you know, disgruntledness, the reason they lived in anger and discontent in the wilderness, the problem was not the wilderness anymore. And we learned that because they continued to live that way, even once they entered the promised land. So what is the root cause of all their rebellion? The problem was not in the wilderness, but the problem was, the heart of the matter was their matter of their heart. This shows how terrible and utterly sinful we are to the core. How completely broken we are because of sin. We, we blame the surrounding. We blame the situation. We blame the desert. Oh, it is so hot. It is so dry. I go th I'm going through this dry patch right now. This dry season. I'm in the deep valleys right now, Lord God. And we tend to. We're so easy to blame our situation. But do you think our hearts would be different? Our hearts would change once all that is resolved? The Bible tells us that will not be the case. Because the problem lies in the bottom of our hearts. They still abandon God. But this time, it is because they're living in the good land. The reason they abandon God this time around is because of all the good things, all the richness, and all the... All the Good things that the land had to offer them. Have you experienced anything like that? Something like this too in your life? Or have you seen it in someone's life? I have many times. I have witnessed it not only in the, in the uh, church, but I'll, I also have witnessed it in my life too. Where you are, so, where you are in such desperation, you, know, you have serious problems and you pray to God, Lord, I am so desperate, Lord, if you just solve this one problem, I promise you, Lord God, I'm going to be faithful to you. Lord, I'm in this grave situation. If you could just make me go over this hump, I will definitely give my life to you, Lord. God, if you, if you could just make me get into this good college, man, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. If I can get this one job, Lord God, if I can get this one person to marry, or if I can, get, if I can have a child, if I can buy this house, this is where we are right now. We're trying to look for a house. If we can just, if you can just help me with this one situation, Lord, I'll be faithful to you. I'll be good to you, Lord God. I will tithe. I will be faithful. I will attend church every week. I'll be faithful to you. And once that problem goes away, we find ourselves going back to our old ways. We're like that too. There's a funny saying in Korean, your heart is different going into the bathroom versus coming out of the bathroom. What do you think it means? It means you're very desperate and anxious at that moment. However, once that problem is solved, you are very, what? You're totally nonchalant or you're totally care carefree. It shows how flippant we are in the heart, right? At one moment, we're so ever so desperate but once that problem goes away, we resort back to our old ways. In today's text, God, knowing the hearts of men, is warning us, warning the Israelites, but warning us at the same time too, that we must remain faithful to the Lord as He is desiring us to be faithful in the wilderness, like we have, saw, like we have looked at last week. He desires us to be faithful even in the good lands, that sometimes he leads us to. 
Even when all things seem to go our way. When we are treading through the good lands of life. Instead of in the, in the wilderness. We must not be prideful. But we must walk with God even more closely, says the Lord. So today, through the text, let's look at how God wants us to tread through the good lands this time. Look at verse 6 with me. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. Let me read to you from the ESV. It says this, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, a fountain and springs, flowing out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, and of pomegranates, and land of olive trees and honey, and a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. So last week, we focused on how we need to live as Christians in the wilderness, in the dry patches of life, in our struggles, in our problems. How can we maintain our faithfulness in the Lord? By focusing on God, on His good purpose and His good provision. But also sometimes when we go through life, God will bring us into a beautiful land that we have just read in the Scripture, where everything is full. Where everything is plenty. Where everything is overflowing. Where everything seems like it is going our way. And what is the life that God wants from us in that good life? Or in that good land? Verse 10 sums it up very nicely. This is where we need to be. In the good land, but also in the wilderness. It says here, And you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Ultimately, the one thing that God wants from us, when we're in the desert or when we're in the, in the promised land, when we're in scarcity or when we're in plenty, one thing God wants from us is that we live to bless the Lord. Amen? That is the bottom line. That is the name that we carry. Magnify the Lord. That is our ultimate purpose of life. And this time, God says, bless the Lord. For he has brought you to a land that is filled, that is a land that is with flowing milk and honey, says the Lord. I mean, he says here, all the beautiful, he goes into the details. Why do you think he's going into the details? All the brooks, the fountains, the springs, all the things that are flowing, the honey, the, the olive trees, the pomegranates, figs, vines, barley, wheat. He's given you all the details because he is... Wanting them to know that when God brings you to a place, He will give you generously. And one thing that He wants from all of us is that we give God glory. We raise our hands and say, I bless you, Lord, for you are good to us. But God knows us too well. He knows our hearts too well. That we are very much prone to leave God even in this goodness too in life. He warns us, verses 11 through 16, read with me here. He says, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes which I command you today. Lest you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them when you and when your herd and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions, the thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the a flinty rock, who, fled you, or who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. That is what God desires of us. God wants to give us the good things. Amen? 
I mean, I'm not preaching here prosperity gospel. But this is the heart of God. When we're in Jesus Christ, the valleys become great. The wilderness becomes rich because we have Christ as our ultimate source of life. And also with Him, if we, if we walk with Him, we'll never run dry. The Lord is my shepherd. There will be nothing that I would need that I would want more because God is with me through the deep valleys of the shadow of death. And God says, I will give you, I will make things multiply you. Your houses, your flock, your herds, your silver, your gold, you will be filled with all that the world will offer to you in me, through me, and through me only, says the Lord. But He knows us so well that once we experience the goodness of God, what is the problem again? Was it the wilderness? Was it the richness of the land? The problem is the heart. Says the Lord in verse 14, He says, Then your heart will be lifted up. Lifted up here meaning become prideful. Your heart will be prideful. And then once you experience the, the plenty in life, the richness in life, the goodness in life, our hearts will be propped up and our hearts will be filled with pride and we are prone to forget the Lord because we are so filled with the gifts and the richness of God. We forget the giver, says the Lord. The problem, once again, is the heart. And then God wants, to, wants us to remember, and I've underlined here the word who, because God is constantly reminding them, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Here, look at verse 14. It says, you know, and you will forget the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? Who led you through the great wilderness? And then at the end of verse 15, who brought you the water out of the flinty rock? Who fed you, the, have fed you in the wilderness with manna? God is saying, you know what? It is I, it is I, it is I. The ultimate bottom line in life is that God wants us to see Him not only in the wilderness, but also in the good lands. But why do you think we leave the Lord so easily? What do you think is the reason? Why do you think we forget the Lord in pride? Because we like to see ourselves more than what we are. We fall into this trap of pride because we're concerned with the things in life. If you read, go back to verse 3. He says, you know what? Man shall not live by bread alone. But all your focus is on the bread of this world. And then God says, you know, instead, you must be focused in the heavenly bread, says God. And if you make your life all about the bread in the world, signifying what? All the material things in the world, which are temporary. If you build your life on the temporary foundation, it will only break down. Right? We will be prone to leave because our foundation is on those temporal things of this world. But God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord, which is the only thing that is constant, eternal, and ever dependent. So this life focused on the temporal, the Bible calls it idolatry. Turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans is in the New Testament. <clears throat> and he sums it up. Paul sums it up very nicely. The problem, the same problem that the Israelites had. Right? They were so focused on all the temporal things of the, of the promised land. They were so focused on the bread, the plenty of bread that they eat in the promised land. The richness of the promised land. They forget God. And this is the same problem people in, in Paul's times experience, but also the same problem that we go through today as well. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. 
For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And here's the problem. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged, again here, this is the exchange, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the, the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So Paul describes the problem that the Israelites experienced when they entered the Promised Land this way. The, Israel, the people of Israel, they were so focused all of their minds, all of their attention was so focused on the things that the promised land could offer them. They began to forget the giver of the promised land. You follow me here? The land was so rich. It was filled with gold, silver, milk, honey, all the things that you can imagine. It is plenty. You don't have to work hard. It was given to them freely. All the houses were there, all the fields were there, all the fruits and all the harvest was ready for them to take. And they were only focused on that, and they exchanged what they were living by. They were living by only the things of the bread of this world. But God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then Romans chapter 1, Paul explains it this way. All the things God created was for what purpose? To reveal the nature of God. To reveal the invisible characteristics of God, says, says Paul in Romans. That is why God created the visible things, so that they would reflect the invisible qualities of God. However, man, in their pride, man are so focused on only the things that their physical eyes can see. They have exchanged. All right, so I'm so focused on the beautiful things of this world. They soon forget that they are a reflection. They are only images of what is a, a creator is like. And they began worshiping the created things instead of the creator. It is the bottom of the problem. That is the, the pride that is working in them, that is taking away their attention away from God and let, allowing them to focus on the things of this world. So are the good things of the promised land bad? Are all the creatures bad then? No, they are to be enjoyed. God has given it to them. If you work hard, I hope you enjoy your big paycheck. Right? If you study hard, it will pay back. Life, God has worked it in a way that if you give your life to it, you will reap the benefits of it. But here's the problem. All those things must be used as tools to draw your attention and point it back to God. That is the bottom line. Your hard work, your intelligence, your beautiful looks, your career, your family, Whatever that we work hard on, on this life, has to be a marker that points you to the Creator. All the gifts of the world that God has so freely given it to us, like all the free things the Promised Land has promised them, has to be an agent that points you back to the giver of the gifts, instead of you making idols out of them. That is the bottom line. That is the bottom line issue that the that we all have that is our problem too and then that is why God constantly reminds them lest you forget lest you forget and he mentioned that in verse 11 take care lest you forget the Lord your God in verse 14 it says forget not 
the Lord your God. And then in verse 19, and if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. God knows that we are so prone to forget because of our pride. And I've seen many pastors, many Christian artists with humble beginnings. They're hungry for the Lord. They have gone through the wilderness. They have made God their everything in their wilderness. But once they gain fame, once they gain attraction, once they have become big, once they have quote unquote made it, I've seen many become digressed little by little. And over a long period of time, they have forgotten their time with the Lord alone in the beautiful fellowship in the wilderness. And you and I, we're not excused from that danger either. And that is why God is warning us this morning, forget not. Because we can easily make things, God's blessings, turn them into an idol. But there is a deeper theological truth I want us to end with. There's a deeper theological truth I want us to take from this passage. And that is found in verse 17 and 18. Let's read together if you may. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Let's read together. Ready, set, go. Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may conform, confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. I've been, I've been trying to hit home the problem of pride. And God addresses it here very blatantly. Because God knows our tendencies. Once we succeed... Once God leads us into the promised land, a land that is rich and that is good, we will say the same things. Or at least, if not publicly or if not exclusively with our words, we will definitely think it in our minds. My power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. If you come to that point, you have already made your wealth, an idol. You have already started to forget all your journeys in the wilderness with the Lord. Because it is not. No matter how rich you become, no matter how powerful you become, no matter how influential you become in this world, no matter how beautiful your family is, no matter how awesome your body is after working so hard on it, all the good things that we reap, we must never think that it is because of my power and the might of my hands. Oh, Pastor James, you don't know how many hours I've put in this project. You don't know how hard I've worked all through high school, middle school even, middle school, high school, all the college. I worked so hard to get my 5.0 GPA, whatever it is that we, we get. I'm glad you did. And I recommend you. I, I commend you highly for it. But we must never come to a place where we, where we say, it is my work. Because verse 18, God says, you shall remember that the Lord your God, for it is He. For it is He. And that's our title too. For it is He who gives you the power to get love. And in, in that includes everything else, right? I'm not just talking about money, but your skills, your talents, your abilities, your achievements, your goals, and your careers. Everything that we work hard to build up on, we must remember that all of that was because God has given you the power to do so. And this problem of pride, God points out, addresses the foundational, even deeper, foundational theological implications for all of us regarding our Christian life too. Not only that can be applied 
that it is He who gives us power to get wealth. Not only that can be applied in our life, but spiritually speaking as well, it could be go, we can take it and go deeper with it and apply it to our Christian spiritual life as well. God is saying that you must remember in order to, in order to keep you from falling while you stand, in order to keep you from your pride, in order to keep you from your idol worship, God says this, you must remember that there is nothing you have contributed in your success. That you cannot say in your own, you can't say in your heart that I have told for my success, for it is mine to boast, but you must remember that it is God who gives you the power to get wealth, to be successful, to enjoy the goodness of the good land. But more than that, we must remember that we can apply that into our spiritual life, and that is our salvation. There is nothing that we can do to earn salvation. There is nothing. Just like it was all God from the beginning for the Israelites. It was God who has led them out of Egypt through a miraculous place. It took ten miraculous plagues for the Israelites to be free. Right? It was God who parted the Red Sea. They were stuck. Red Sea in the front, Egyptian army in the back, they were stuck. They could do absolutely nothing. But it took God's miraculous power parting the Red Sea, they were able to escape death once again. It was through miraculous giving of the manna. It was through miraculous giving of quail, water, all the things that Israel went through. It was all God and God and God and God. And that should remind us it's the same going forward. And why should we now think that our success is because of us? My hard work, my intelligence, my goodness. If we succeed, it is because of God. And that goes the same for our spiritual life too. There is nothing that you and I can do to make God love you more. Because we are utterly sinful. Just like the Israelites who are only prone to rebel and disown God through the, through the wilderness and through the promised land. All we can conjure up is sinful methods. Everything comes short. But it has to take something beyond us to be saved. Something beyond our powers. And that is why God has sent Jesus Christ to rescue us, just like He has rescued Israel out of Egypt in the miraculous fashion. God can only rescue us in our deepest pride and in our sin, just tearing us out of our old self through His miraculous power, through His grace and grace only, that we can have life that can solve the problem of our sins. The moment you wake up, it is because of God's grace. Because there are many who don't wake up and have life, enjoy the morning. The, the moment that we're able to stand up on our two feet is also because of the grace of God. Because there are so many who can't even stand up on their two feet. The moment we can learn things through our brains, through our experiences, through our studies, is also a grace of God. Because there are so many who are unable to. Just like that, our life, our salvation, is only given to us through Jesus Christ. There's a couple of verses in the bulletin here. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 3. And I want to end with these couple of verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Let's read together, if we can. I mean, you can look it up in your Bible, or you can look it up in the bulletin. Romans 8, verse 3. Let's read together in the ESV version. Ready, set, go. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. But this verse, I like the NIV translation better. It's, it's a little bit more dramatic. Because it says this way, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. 
God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful flesh. What the, what, the, what, the, what the law, what the law could not do because of its powerlessness, because it was weakened by the flesh, right? God has given them the law to, to have a relationship with God, but because of our sin, it was weakened and it became powerless because we can't do anything to restore a relationship with the Lord. But what the law could not do, God did for you and for me. Titus 3, 5 says this, He saved us not because of the works done by us in the righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. What we could not do, God did it for us. And that is why, I mean, God is ever so consistent in how He deals with us. It is the same way God dealt with the Israelites. It is the same way He will deal with them in the wilderness and in the promised land. God desires the grace. God desires the people to know that it was all God to begin with and to the end. And He wants the same for us too. And God saved us by His way, by His Son. And that will bring us to a place where we cannot have anything to boast on our own. Because we know so well that it is only through grace that we're saved. Not by works, but it's the free gift of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I will end with this quote. It is also in the bulletin. It is not thy hold on Christ that saves thee. It is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee. It is Christ. It is not even thy faith in Christ, although that be the instrument it is Christ's blood and merit. And I hope that that becomes our anthem, not only for salvation, but for life. Whatever success that, I hope that we become successful in all that you do, in anything that you pursue. I will pray and I will work hard to be a support so that you can live a successful life for Jesus Christ and be an instrument used to bring the kingdom on earth. But I pray that we would never forget that it was my might, it was your might, but it is He who gives us the power. And that is why all of our lives are to be lived to glorify God and God. With that thought in mind, let's come to the Lord in prayer.